to Unbound Bay Area Book Festival's virtual conversations. Today we'll be talking to the students from the Grayton Writing Project, uh, Bay, Area, uh, Bay Area Book Festival's uh, Grayton Writing Project. I'm Greg Saris, Chairman of the Federated Indians of Grayton Rancheria, and I'll be hosting the show today. Uh, each of our student writers will be uh, telling you the title of their work, reading for a couple minutes and then I, a few of them I will ask questions as we go along. The theme this year was environmental issues. We thought, um, again, with so much talk of the environmental crisis that's been going on and how it's connected to everything, whether it be the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it be um, the COVID issue, seems that everything these days is related in some form or other to environmental issues, something that for our people who are descendants of Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok, Bay Area Indian folks here, have been important to us. We took care of the landscape for 10,000 years. And so these students uh, drew on uh, that, a lot of the traditional knowledge, their own interests and concerns regarding environmental issues. And they've written everything from poetry to dystopian fiction, to essays, um, and all remarkable. And I'm so proud to present all of them today. I also want to express my profound thanks to our teacher, Sabrina, to the Bay Area Book Festival, Sherilyn, all of you for hosting this and creating such a wonderful project. I believe this is our third year, and uh, it's just been amazing. I, as a person who's taught in universities for over 30 years, to see students at this level writing so well and being so clear about what it is they're writing about is not only heartwarming, but incredibly impressive to me, an old professor and teacher and writer for that matter. So um, again, everyone, welcome and students, welcome. Today, we're gonna start with Nicole Biji and Nicole, um, if you would be so we're proud to uh, tell us the title of your work and read a couple, read for a couple of minutes anywhere you want in your story. The title of my piece is Smoke Signals and some brief context is it's from the point of view of a buffalo who lives in the Great Plains and it's his take on the depletion of both the native populations and his populations from environmental issues and pollution. Our souls, our fur, our bones, our meat, every single part of us was sacred to the native people. We were not just a sport or a profit for them. We were worshiped. We were the golden animal of their culture, the one that every boy and girl knew well. They knew our worth, but the white man did not. They disregarded our spiritual value and existence. At first, they brought rifles and bullets, pointing and aiming without a care in the world for the damage they were causing. They were so naive and ignorant of their power, their power to destroy and to take. My human friends grew more scarce as their homeland was destroyed and turned into a field of decay. They no longer sang loud and danced free. They no longer grazed the fields. No, the white man got to them. They fought to survive, but their fight was no match for such, for such ruthlessness. I never heard gunshots, but I saw more and more bodies on the dry ground of the Great Plains, lifeless and silent. My grandmother told me of the white man's destruction of our population and warned me that they will be back because they always come back. I was always on high alert, waiting for the hunters, the men in hats with guns, but they never came. I was sure I was safe, and for a while, I even felt protected from their lethal weapons. My grandmother was right, though. They came, but not in the way I ever imagined. It was a silent and slow takeover. The grass began to become drier and more brittle. The dirt cracked, and the plants became less plentiful. I could see smoke in the distance, but this smoke looked unfamiliar. It was not smoke of a native campfire or ceremony. 
It was unlike the smooth and luminous fog that hung low above the golden fields in the early mornings at dawn. It was lethal, one that would slowly do away with each and every creature. Its name is pollution. It is a silent killer, one who destroys and destructs without an ounce of empathy in its veins for the lives it takes. It depletes the plants that I eat. It dries the soil I walk on. It suffocates me as it slowly takes my life. The herds began to deplete and my brothers and sisters were soon gone as they laid lifeless in the fields of decay. Pollution is deadly, yet it is brushed aside, looked at as a minuscule problem. I continue to see it as it lingered in the deep blue sky above the now sad and decaying fields of grass. The grass wept as its soul was slowly torn from the earth, left without not an ounce of moisture to survive. What were we going to eat now that the grass laid spiritless in the fields? How were we going to survive? Thank you, Nicole. A really beautiful piece. One, the question I had when I was reading your work is, uh, you, you chose to write from the point of view of a, a buffalo from your tradition. Do you want to talk a little, just a little bit about why you, how you chose to write from the point of view of the buffalo, the sacred animal of the plains people? I think the reason I chose to write from that point of view is because I see such an overlap with the Native people and the connection that they have to the buffalo in such a spiritual way. And how I wrote about the buffalo's populations being depleted it was there to show the depletion of the native people as well. So I decided to try to connect them and have an underlying meaning of the buffalo representing the native populations. And that you did. Thank you. So our next reader will be Abriana Cordova. Okay. Um, my piece is called A Simpler Life, A Healthier Planet. Climate change is a problem that has gone on for quite some time, has affected not only humans, but plants, animals, and the environment. This ongoing rise of temperature is negatively impacting our planet as a whole. However, climate change is not only increasing temperatures, it is shifting weather patterns and the cause of abnormal climate as well. There are multiple factors that have led to the increase of greenhouse gases and the rise of temperature. The majority of these factors are part of our everyday lives. As human tactics have evolved over time, Climate change has progressed. Climate change was not always a problem. Back when native people lived the most simplistic lifestyles and only produced the items they needed, the earth was at ease. There was no pollution and the environment was taken care of. It wasn't until industrialization and mass production of goods that climate change really began. If people only produced and took what was necessary from the earth, climate change and pollution would decrease significantly. My ancestors used natural resources to produce goods they needed for their everyday lives. Nature is the basis of all native life, religion, medicine, writings, food, clothing, art, and daily rituals. The process of making goods and performing these practices were not harmful to nature. They treated the environment with honor. Nature provided them with food, shelter, and a place to start their lives. So they loved and respected their land. Pomo natives and other Native American tribes have a strong bond and respect for nature. Mother nature provides so much. I have been raised to treat our earth with respect and be grateful for what it has given my family. For instance, when my tribe dances during the strawberry festival or big time, we feed the fire before anyone else eats. This is done to give thanks to our ancestors who have paved the way for our generation of native youth and to honor our creator. Uh, Brianna, thank you. I love the way that you talk about in a very scientific way about the issues that are going on today. And then at the end, you bring back what we did here and what we continue to do to remember the earth. Uh, Abriana, thank you. Um, Camarina Elgin is next. Hi, um, my reading is Climate Change and How It Affects Native Americans. Okay. Everything on earth has a purpose, every disease and herb to cure it, and every person a mission. This is the Indian theory of existence, Crystal Kuntoskit, 1888 to 1936, Salish. Climate change is affecting everyone right now, but indigenous people are among the first to face the consequences directly. This is due to their close relationship to the environment and natural resources. Native cultures are tied to certain places, plants, and animals, but with climate change occurring, many of these key components of native culture can be lost. Other difficulties faced by indigenous communities include political and economic marginalization, human rights violation, and unemployment. 
What should be done to create a sustainable future? Climate change majorly impacts tribal nations' access to traditional foods. While it is true that for countless generations, certain foods have provided cultural, economic, medicinal, and community health, in present times, traditional food and plants are becoming increasingly difficult to find. Higher temperatures can result in the loss of native grass and plants used for medicine, as well as erosion that permits the invasion of non-native plants. Fire frequency could also increase with more fuel and lightning strikes degrading the land. Shifting from traditional lifestyles and diets could have even more downsides. Indigenous people could now experience persistent poverty, food insecurity, and the cost of non-traditional foods. Additionally, climate change is likely to amplify other indirect effects to traditional foods, including limited access to gathering places, hunting grounds, and environmental pollution. In coastal California, there have been increases of tree diseases due to the temperature change and increased fire frequency. Invasive pathogens or the tree disease sudden oak death is, ex is expected to continue spreading and worsen by climate change. Pathogen outbreaks are sensitive in humidity and temperature. Many California tribes, such as the Yurok, Paiute, Western Mono, and Miwok, rely on oaks and acorns as a resource. As global warming continues, the tr these tree diseases continue affecting native forested ecosystems. All in all, indigenous participation and perspectives in climate change initiatives can be a solution for more resilience in indigenous communities. Leaders, scientists, students, and activists, and research managers from all across the United States have been participating in climate change groups. They encourage sharing and discussing the impacts, needs, and strategies for adaptation and alleviation. A second solution is to increase federal support for tribal communities. We don't know what lies within our future or if climate change will continue. A sustainable future can only be created if we work together and prioritize. All right, thank you, Camarena. Again, great facts, things that folks need to understand. And once again, the connection between climate change and the effects on the environment, in this case, particularly uh, the, for the lifestyles and needs of indigenous people. Thank you. Isabella, you're next. Isabella Garza. Hi, I will be reading an excerpt from my piece, The Road to an Everlasting Globe. And it's basically just about an activist and his journey on becoming an activist and how it connects to him being native. Um, people have lived their lives and have been through so many emotions and events, but many people's main concern is if there will be others in the future to live life as others have in the past. What most people do not understand is that all we currently know is that there is just one earth. It's the people who are on it now that are the ones with the ability to choose whether or not our descendants have an amazing future. I'm one of the few people who care about the future and I want to help those who aren't as aware of the impact they have on this earth. For those who don't know, my name is Stefan. I have been an activist for about three years now and I want to let you know how you can help our world for the better. Three years ago, I wanted to make a change, but I didn't know how I could. Those who feel like they're in the same place as I was three years ago, this is definitely something to keep reading. From my experience, the littlest changes someone makes in their daily lives will make the biggest difference. Isabella, thank you for sharing. And most importantly, thank you for caring. Thank you so much, Isabella. Um, next, we have Teata. Teata. Hello, um, I will be reading a small excerpt from my piece titled Riverbed. The wind reluctant, not winced by the surface tension of the rapid water, causing the coalesce of the elements, quickening the rush to the exceeding dunamont. Even then, refraining myself from its uncurated glisten was not plausible. To touch it, that is all. To endure a searing cold, able to seize the trance. With each step, searing pain followed. My objective? to make it into the shallows of the transparent river bank. This habit of mine continue, continues. I refuse to accept walking among the sand with any type of footwear. Though this habit will never die, my capability to exec execute it may become furthermore constricted. As the newly translucent river grew warm with green, thoughts of its updated status did not worry most. It was just a drought year. 
At the once astonishing riverbed, the river's pace was virtually halted. The fa flailing children in the shallows seemed to have managed to create what wasn't able to naturally occur, pushing the reckless young adults to the, their vantage point, to the rope swing tied to the bygone tree, whose sturdy limbs must have carried countless adrenaline junkies. Ah, uh, Teata, thank you so much. Beautiful. Good job. <laughs> Keep writing. Uh, Shailene Lazinto, you are next. Okay, thank you. I will be reading What Can I Do? Okay. What can I do, dear mother? Mother, you wrapped me in your arms when I was born and hugged me as tight as you would dare. Dear mother, with love you take care of me more than I could ever know. Dear mother, your undying generosity has let us grow. Planting the seeds of an idea in my heart, letting the root, roots dig in, it is fed with my love. Dear mother, you brought me into this world and have nourished my family with everything you have to offer. You whisper with your wind and I back, my letters of love to you folded in little paper boats sink into your streams. My words mix with the waves, washing away the sad sorrows of a whispering girl. Dear mother, I love you more than I can tell. Dear mother, you hide it well, but I know you are getting sick, aren't you? You have become tired and wilted like your leaves in autumn, and your temperature is running high. Your love for life is running low. Dear mother, your once crystalline streams run tepid and murky. Lush forests that reach in great splendor for the sky are reduced to ash or burnt stumps. The world is on fire, calling out for us with a burning urgency. Dear mother, what can I do to help you now? Dear mother, do not leave me now. We need you more than ever. Dear mother, you have left me with a notion, scalded into my heart. This is up to us now. It always has been. To move forward, we need to, to work with what we have. Our best resource is each other and working to become more environmentally conscious, bringing awareness within our communities and reaching out is important. We have overpopulated, polluted the air we breathe, the water we swim in and drink from, the land we've cultivated and share um, needs to be, um, uh, <laughs> sorry. The land we've cultivated and shared has become polluted now. We have cleared out vast expanses of forest. These actions um, cause the planet to be transfigured into a place without breathable air, um, lacking clean water and eroding soil, and changes to the climate. This is a call for change, a desperate and all-uniting need. We need to survive, um, and we all share the desire to thrive together on a planet that flourishes. Within, um, it is within our nature to nurture what we love and what we care about. Um, would it not be true to say that you love the soil you stand on, the water you swam in and drank from? Everyone relies on these resources. To say it is um, possible to make change if we are united is true. We must work together to make these changes that we want to see, to change our environment for, that we live in for the better. Not only do we live here now, but so did our ancestors who walked this earth before us, and so will generations to come. Working with nature to cultivate um, their dreams of living um, human to nature as one. Living with healthy planet was their reality, and if we work hard um, and bring our best efforts forward, we can bring that into uh, fruition. First, you must ask yourself, though, what can I do? We all need to keep asking that. Thank you so much. And your poem was beautiful, Shaylee. Thank you. Keep writing. Uh, Mia Nunez is next. Hello. I will be reading an excerpt from my essay titled Seeing the Future Through a Cloud of Black Smoke. Chances are that you have seen a factory covered in black smoke, but you didn't think anything of it because you were in your car with the AC on, listening to music, thinking today is a good day. Maybe it was a good day. Maybe there are still great memories that you can make today. Maybe even tomorrow or the day after that. However, whether you think you've seen it or not, climate change is happening right now, in this exact moment. 
because there could be a next week for you, but maybe not for another person, animal, or plant that you walk past on your way to work. Maybe you could even say that you're healthy enough to live another month, because you probably are. But what about next year or the next decade? Well, I am a 15-year-old girl who would hope to be married by 2050 with a kid. But instead, I have to worry about the air I have to breathe and how far I have to move from the ocean before it catches up to me. Sadly, not just in the town I live in, but in several large forests around the world, forest fires have been reoccurring. Almost every year, we have one bigger than the last. Tree after tree, home after home, just burning down. Some have been started by people, maybe as an accident, maybe not. Either way, those trees also release an extremely large amount of carbon dioxide. Plants are one of the main organisms that take carbon out of the atmosphere, so when we lose them, it can largely affect the surrounding areas. We don't want to plant a whole bunch of trees just for another fire to happen. So what else can we do to help? Well, gardens also provide a large variety of plants and food. They're small, but a big aid in helping to fix climate change. It helps reduce food waste, and it can be fun for some people. But what if you don't like gardening or you don't know where to start? My tribe luckily has a garden that we can help with when we have time or when our after-school program or summer camp takes us. You can also find community gardens close to you by simply asking around or looking it up online. These days, there's a lot happening everywhere. Many people are trying to make change for themselves and future generations. Yet for some reason, that still doesn't include helping the planet. At this rate, with a very small amount of people focusing on helping the Earth, there won't be a next generation saved. You won't be those great grandchildren you always wanted. You won't be able to take your kids fishing like you always wanted to because there won't be any fish to catch. Next generations won't be able to walk outside without a mask that helps filter the air around them. Other animals will die and eventually we will too. Believing in someone else or wishing upon a star for a better earth can only take you so far. Eventually you have to make a change too. Not just one person, but everyone, the whole community and then some. Everyone just needs a little motivation, and all you have to say is, I will try. Then maybe in a few months, you will say, I will do, or I am healing the earth. Thank you. Mia, thank you. Um, you know, you, you, you ask a question in your work that I often ask and wonder about when I look at you young people. I always think, what are your eyes going to see? And you told me what your eyes are going to see and that you're worried about it. Um, you, I want to compliment you for your, your, for saying it, for speaking to the young people. As much as asking about what you wrote, um, I hope you're going to, I believe in your strength that you're going to keep talking about this. Are you going to keep writing and talking about this? That's my question because you do it so well. Um, yes, I definitely will because I, I didn't, before writing this, I didn't really think about the big impact, but after doing research about it and um, writing and reading about other people's experiences, I realized how um, oblivious we are to it. And I think I, the, me um, doing that research, even that small amount of research can just help educate so many people and can make a big difference. Amen. And the earth says that too. Thank you so much, Mia. Thank you. <laughs> great, great job. Marcos, Marcos Oaks, you are up next. Hi, uh, it's not Let Me Try on my uh, microphone. Oh, there we go. All right, cool. Hi, I'm Marcos. I'm going to be reading a fictional story I call The Woodlands. So... Once upon a time in the land of change, there was a group of animals uh, named the Woodlands. The Woodlands consisted of four members, Joey, Michael, Ashton, and Max. The group were all wolves, and they lived in the same habitat as each other. The climate change made it so the wolves needed to share and preserve each meal, which they started to get tired of. The Woodlands and their people have had to share the scarce supplies they have. The Woodlands have just about had it, so they decided to make a change. Though the land was named changed, there hasn't been a change in anything in, in uh, many years. The climate only continues to rise as coal corporations known as the smokes keep producing very, very harmful fumes to the land, which was mainly powered by gophers, except a very small group of animals that have no choice but to work there. The woodlands have an idea to protest in front of the building and not leave until the land... Uh, 
decides to have a more eco-friendly way of producing power. As the first week passed, they met a few uh, faces who worked at the factory. One seemed to stand out, though, because his reason to work there was different than everyone else's. A duck named Cricket. He was a shy but laid-back duck. The, uh, the reason he was working at the factory because, was because there was no other job that would take a duck. When Cricket listened to their plan, he decided to join the protest. The protest cons consisted of a row of people just shouting, free the land for 6,000 a day, basically. There were rumors of a new fuel source in the, ca in the clouds the uh, birds can get to much easier, but it would put the gophers out of work. After long talks among the woodlands and, and Cricket, they decided to propose a new work for the uh, gophers to the mayor. Um, tunnels to find gasoline for cars. It'll help an animals like uh, turtles, etc., that can't um, move very fast. By the end of the year of the peaceful protests and their help, uh, and their help, the harmful building was torn down and a new fuel resource was found. Little do they know, cars would be another harmful climate enemy, but that's for another fight uh, years down the line. Marcos, I really enjoyed reading your story. Um, you need to keep writing this fiction. You got it. Great job. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of you, I, if I didn't mention, all the writing is going to be collected in an anthology here at the end. And so you'll get a chance. I know some of you want to hear more from the stories, especially like Marcos is another of the writing you've heard, but you'll get a chance. It'll all be collected in the great anthology. So um, again, Marcos, thanks so much. Javier, next. Javier. Xavier. Xavier, okay. Um, my hey, piece... Hey, hey. <laughs> Hello. My piece was really trying to get the point across of climate change and just the facts in general. So my piece is called, We're All Gonna Die. <laughs> Do you know how much pollution and climate change are affecting your everyday life? In California, where I live, wildfires are a constant possibility. The firestorms of 2017 and 2019 were the worst. Together, they cost $14.8 billion. Besides the money they cost, they also make a lot of pollution. So much so people can get diseases from the pollution in the air. Pollution can literally kill you. These fires are just a tiny example of the massive amounts of pollution pumped into the air every day. The most ridiculous thing is that we know exactly what we're doing. We're very aware of how we're harming the planet, and yet look at what we're doing. A lot of people simply don't care. That is embarrassing. Climate change and pollution is going to destroy the only known habitable planet and the only known source of life, and we're all going to die. In my immediate community, the effects of climate change are also visible. Tole Lake is a historical place for the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria. The vast landscape is beautiful and almost surreal. In 20 to 30 years, it'll all be destroyed by climate change. It's a place with so much history from hundreds of years ago to history we're still making today. For such a beautiful place, it's sad it'll be gone soon. I just hope if I have kids, they can see it at least once before it's gone. Tole Lake is just one of the many places that would be detrimental for all the people around it once it's gone. Water pollution is a huge problem. Our oceans and groundwater are the most dangerous. In 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Sea creatures often eat this plastic, choke and die, or get sick and die. Plastic in the ocean destroys habitats. Animals will have nowhere to go. The rising acidity in the ocean is our biggest problem. It will make many species extinct. Plankton is at the very bottom of the food chain, and if that goes, so does everything else. Plankton is just one example of an animal at the bottom of the food chain affecting the rest. 
Groundwater pollution is also a huge problem. It happens when chemicals make their way down into soil. Oil, soap, soda, plastic, bleach, anything liquid that isn't water pollutes the groundwater. And one of the biggest polluters may or may not be su surprising, but it's cigarettes, or more specifically, discarded cigarette butts. An experiment on YouTube shows a man dropping a single cigarette butt into a fish tank, and eight of ten of the fish died within five hours. And that's just one cigarette butt. One of our biggest sources of water is groundwater. Soon you'll be drinking bleached, soapy, oily, plastic cigarette ash water. <laughs> How's that sound to you? <laughs> Polluted groundwater also kills plants and entire habitats. And if you hadn't noticed already, we kind of like need plants. <laughs> Without plants, we all die. So hold on to your trash, throw it away. It's not, it's just not that hard. Take your car to the car wash instead of using soap and let it seep into the ground. Once again, it's just not that hard. In California, groundwater is our biggest source of water. And 50% of all that water we get from the ground is unusable due to pollution. During a drought especially, 60% of California's water comes from the ground. But due to global warming, we have to rely on groundwater more. But due to water pollution, groundwater has become less reliable. So because of those things, we have to rely on a not very reliable source. So what happens when there's no water? The sad reality of it is we'd probably just sit there and die. So instead of that, we should get together, make a plan, and get it done. Before you go make a car factory, before you go eat a giant cheeseburger, before you go buy your 24-pack of water bottles, before you wash your car, and before you go inhaling your death sticks, cigarettes, think about the impact you have on our environment. We only have one Earth, and as of right now, we're not going to relocate anywhere else. So let's take a care of the lowly planet we call home. For if we don't, we're all going to die. Uh, 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 amazing, Xavier. Um, you know, you have, uh, whether you know it or not, you have many writers listening to you, older professional writers. And what we all strive for is in our writing, especially our essay writing, as you wrote an essay, is to have strong examples to make our point. Boy, do you ever have strong, pointed examples that hit the reader right in the face, Xavier. Uh, did you do a lot of research? Did you put this yeah. stuff? Talk about that a little bit, if you would. Well, I had already known about this for a long time, and it's not something that's new to me, especially because of my culture and background. But a lot of the facts were new to me. Like, that was just, so there was more to that essay. I kind of skipped on a couple parts because I didn't want it to be too long. But um, for example, it takes 2,500 gallons of water for one pound of ground beef. And that's like, I mean, that's just a crazy statistic that I didn't even know about. So, yeah, it's, it was really cool to do the research. Well, you used it well, Xavier. And uh, I'm proud of you. Keep going. Keep writing. The way. You keep writing it that way. You will make a dent in this big problem. Trust me. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Xavier. Okay, the next person we have is Isaiah. Isaiah Perez. I'm going to be reading a piece called My Community. Okay. There are many problems in my community, and a major one is littering, and it needs to be fixed. Littering, littering can cause a lot of problems, and may, many are very important to the community. If animals eat something toxic, they can get sick, maybe even die. Littering can also affect oceanic areas. I saw many photos of seals or turtles getting stuck in nests that people will just throw into the ocean. Littering, littering may endanger some animals. Once those animals are endangered and once they go extinct, other animals in the food chain have to rely on something else. Littering can lead to soil, water, and air pollution. Hazardous chemicals can leach out of the litter and pollute the soil and water, body, water bodies nearby. 
So if the soil gets polluted, people can't grow crops. We need someone to speak up for, for the community and speak up for mine. A lot of areas in my neighborhood have a lot of garbage laying all over the floor. Every time I walk to the store down the street, it looks like puddles, but it's not water, it's puddles of trash. I'd pick up some of the trash, but there's just too much for just one person to do. I think a, re a part that causes that is homeless population because they have nowhere to go throw stuff away. There are many ways to reduce this problem, but s s um, sorry. Um, I think there are many ways to reduce this problem, but some might not work. Try not to buy as much disposable stuff, such as bags, water bottles, because they can just be left on the streets or animal habitats. Also would be a good example. What does that mean? It means to try to throw away stuff in front of people that look up to you, like siblings or other family members. Also try to remind people of the consequences the people or the environment will have if people litter. We can try to put more trash cans into the public area. Maybe putting more trash cans around the area will people will probably see more trash and throw their stuff away. I think the city of Santa Rosa and many other cities should have this community day when everyone comes out and just picks up trash for a couple hours. But I don't think people would take time out of their day to pick up trash, so maybe we can have a prize at the end for whoever picks up the most trash. That would give people motivation to go to that event and pick up trash. People can post the event on social media and put up some flyers around the public area. Littering is a major problem in my community and many other places in this world and needs to be fixed. Isaiah, I'm going to take that idea to the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. Great idea. Thank you so much, Isaiah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great job. Elena Salgado is next. Hi. Um, so I'll be reading from my piece called Slowly Melting. Let's talk about the climate crisis in our native community. Do you think it has affected us much? I think it has been increasingly changing our world. To experts, it seems like the average global temperature all around the world has accelerated at the fastest rate in our recorded history. If you didn't know, global warming occurs when carbon dioxide and other air pollutants combine together. They absorb the sunlight and solar radiation that has bounced off the Earth's surface. These mo molecules hang around in the air, causing global warming. I am against global warming because it, because it is harming our beautiful Earth. Global warming is hurting all parts of it. It is causing the disappearance of glaciers, early snowmelt, and droughts, which will increase the risk of wildfires and major water, sh water shortage. Disturbance of habitats of coral reefs and alpine meadows could make many plant and animal species go extinct. Since global warming also causes air pollution, it will increase the risk of allergies, asthma, and infectious disease outbreaks. My first reason as to why I'm against global warming is because it's affecting many regions of our country. For instance, it has been affecting Alaska in many ways. A lot of Alaska native tribes have been very affected by global warming as well. In one way, it has been causing many major droughts since the weather has been getting warmer. When the weather gets warmer, it melts. Sorry. <laughs> Um, when the weather gets warmer, it melts all of the ice and glaciers, when, which cause floods and erosion. Surprisingly, Alaska has warmed twice as fast as the rest of our country. The average annual temperature has increased by 3 degrees Fahrenheit. In the winter, it has increased by 6 degrees Fahrenheit. Alaskans are already starting to see an earlier snowmelt, global glacier tree, drier landscapes, and more insect outbursts and wildfires because of global warming. Arctic summer sea ice is withdrawing faster than earlier on and is expected to virtually disappear mid-century. Now there is only about half as much sea ice as was recorded in the, sat in the satellite records in 1979. With the late summer ice's edge position farther north than it used to be, storms make larger waves and a lot more coastal erosion. One Alaskan tribe has already started to move to escape erosion, and many other tribes are trying to as well. Have you been doing anything to help prevent global warming? 
What are some ways you can think of that can help save our Earth? What's the single biggest way you can make an impact on global warming change? There are so many different ways you can help prevent this threat to our community. For example, reduce your water waste. When brushing your teeth or washing your hands, make sure not to let the water run. Turn off the tap when you don't need it running. Save water, saving water reduces carbon pollution too. It reduces it because it takes a lot of energy to pump heat and treat the water we use. Another example is to not let your plugs sit in your outlet. Unplug them when you don't need them. They still use a lot of power even when you're not using them. So try your best not to leave fully charged electronics connected to your outlets. If we keep in mind the small things like these two examples, we can slowly prevent global warming, this, this global warming pandemic. We as a community who are all experiencing the same thing should take account and help each other through this. Uh, thank you. Oh, and again, more facts, things that people need to hear. I, you know, now I, after reading your piece, um, I'm very conscious of leaving my phone plugged in. I, I was guilty of that. I would plug it in at night going, oh, it'll be 100% in the morning and leave it there all night instead of just for an hour, right? Yeah. Thank you for helping educate an old man. <laughs> uh, thank you, Elena. Andrew, Andrew Salgado is next. Hi. Um, all right. Um, I didn't really put a name on this one, like for the like the title. So, all right. I just rolled out of bed when I felt when I felt the sun beaming on my face. It instantly woke me up because it was so bright. I put on my uniform and I kissed my wife Rose on the cheek, and I kissed my son Ed on the forehead also, saying a good morning. Then I ate some avocado toast and went on my way to work. When I showed up at work, I saw my good friend Gerald waiting for me with an extra coffee in his hand. When I approached Gerald, he gave me my favorite type of coffee. Then my boss came out of his office and said, Good morning, fellas. Are you guys ready for another hard day of work? Not really, mumbled the workers with a sigh, walking away. Then Gerald and I got to our certain spot where we go every day of work. Luckily, me and Gerald work right by each other so we can talk as much as we want. A couple hours go by of me and Gerald just working on the cars. Gerald got, Gerald got bored of doing the same thing over and over, so Gerald said, Hey, Bob, did you hear about the billionaire that just built a house at the top of the hill right next to our houses? Bob replied, I didn't know he was a billionaire. Does he own a big company or something like that? Gerald replied, Yeah, I think he owns a cigarette business. I also heard he likes cars a lot, so he might come in here and buy some cars from us. A few hours of hard work later, we had our lunch break. While we are on our break, Gerald and I always smoke some cigarettes. We say it's kind of like a tradition for us. Then Gerald and I just work for the rest of the day, for the rest of the day, like any other day. We both got off of our. We both got off at seven o'clock p.m. at the same time. Then, when I got home, I grew to my family and ate some chicken soup. Then I passed out because I worked so hard that day. The next day was just like any other day. I woke up, put on my uniform, kissed my wife and my son, ate my favorite dish, and then I was on my way towards work. But when I arrived at my job, everyone was looking at the list that was hanging on the wall. I was very, I was very curious of what, what, about what was on the list. When I scooted through the crowd of dirty workers, I noticed that the list said that at the end of the week, we, are, we all have to make 1,000 cards. The whole crowd of workers looked very confused and was mad at the same time. Um, then our boss came out of office and said, if we don't get all these cards done by the end of the week, we will, get out, we will be out of business. After a few seconds of silence, the boss, came, the boss said, get to work. But while me and Gerald went to our spots, we talked about how we all usually live check by check and this car business has been struggling since the beginning. So I wouldn't, so it wouldn't be a surprise to all of our workers if we went out of business. Gerald and I went to our spot to smoke some cigarettes for our lunch. Gerald told me, I don't even know how we were gonna make all these cars. Uh, should I stop because it's been like three minutes? Wow. <laughs> 
my things, my story's super long, so it was like four pages. Andrew, it's super good. Uh, and you need to be, a, you're, you're writing fiction and your pacing as a writer is really, really great. And I have writers in this room that are nodding their heads in approval. Uh, keep writing, Andrew. And for those of you who want to hear what happens when you, this billionaire gets on top of a mountain and makes these people build thousands of cars, read the rest of the story. <laughs> so, right. Thank you so much, Andrew. Great right, job. Thank you. Yep. The next person, Alina Stafford. Hi, I'm Alina Stafford. I'm from Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. I'm a junior in high school. The, uh, this is my essay. The fires in 2017, the Tubbs fires happened in Santa Rosa around the lo local coffee park and my Nana was affected. That was really sad to me because she lost everything. 22 people died in the Tubbs fire. We helped my Nana and supported her during this hard time. We would in invite her over a lot and make her feel better all the time. I saw sadness in my Nana. She lost her house and I wanted to help her, but I was just little and I didn't know what to do. I saw burnt houses and sad people and now people are really sensitive about fires. Now the coffee park is recovering and my Nana is fine and I'm glad she's okay. In 2018, there were little fires in Ukiah and it canceled school for about a week. It made the air really bad. I saw a lot of smoke. It was hard to breathe and I went with my Nana to LA, but I was scared to leave my family during a hard time. I missed my friends and worried about them. A few days later, everything was fine and I had fun without stressing out and my family was safe. In 2019, there were really bad fires that started in Geyserville, California through January 1st, 2019 through December from through December 14th, 19. This affected everyone around Geyserville. At the time, my family and I were trying to move. We couldn't move. It was really scary. My mom and siblings were not just affected. My dad, Nana, and we're two. Schools in Cloverdale, Geyserville, Hillsburg, Windsor, and Santa Rosa, to name a few, had to close. At the time, I went to Hillsburg High, which was canceled for almost two weeks. We were trying to move to Windsor from Cloverdale, but Windsor was blocked off so nobody could go in. The fires burned almost a whole area of Geyserville and some people don't have homes now. About 259,823 acres were burned. Eight people died. It was hard to keep in touch with family and friends, to check on them, to make sure they were safe. I wanted to make sure everyone was okay during the fires. I saw big flames and it smelled bad. The fires even burned down wineries and people lost their jobs. Sometimes during the fires at night, I would be scared to go to sleep because the wind was blowing so hard. In 2019, 2020, the Australian fires took place. This didn't affect me, but I still want to talk about it. The animals made me the most sad. I was super hurt when I heard about the animals through there were some good people helping. I also feel bad for the people who lost their houses. All right, Alina, thank you. I, thank you for that, giving us a firsthand account of what was lost in yeah. an actual environmental disaster, the fire. So thank you so much. Uh, Malaya Silva is next. Malaya. My piece is called Yesterday. The ocean water catches the breeze, moving with each tide as a pattern. The animals and wildlife are confused to what is happening. Yet to many people on this earth, it doesn't matter. I sit on the grainy golden sand and wonder where this world has gone. As the world is so full of plastic and trash, the animals can't protect their own spawn. We as humans are constantly consumed by the minuscule things like hair and nails that we often forget where our actions can prevail. Not only for us, but for the, but the universe. When all the stars align, they converse and talk about how our actions led up to this detrimental change in the community. 
Yet it took dying animals and plastic in the sea to come together in unity. We have the effect on society to make a change, yet some consider making our world a better place, but still throw it away. As there is tr trash across the way, they throw on the ground and watch our home diminish away. The place that we have built through historic and cultural trauma, a place that was once considered an honor, a gift from Mother Nature. Yet if we continue our acts of throwing this earth away, it'll be a place of the past called yesterday. Uh, you wrote a poem, Malaya, and uh, pointed, touching, and you rhymed. Great job. Uh, hard. <laughs> that was a great job, Malaya. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Tabanera, you are next. All right. Um, hello, my name is Alex Tabanera, and I'm a Federated Indian of Great Rancheria. I'm also in ninth grade. The climate crisis in my community. Throughout the year, the climate crisis affects Kitsap County. Lately, we don't get a lot of rain, and all the leaves and tree on the trees and other things start turning different colors, like yellow and brown. But when we get rain, our plants stay healthy and are blooming and green. Another name for the state I live in is the evergreen state, maybe because when it does rain here, everything is green. First, I'll tell you about the climate here in Bremerton, Washington, and the percentages. We get a pretty good amount of rain per year, and the average amount of rain is 49 inches. From time to time, we also get uh, three inches of snow. And according to climate websites, we get roughly 151 days of sunshine. To speak a bit more about natural occurrences in my area, the Port Orchard, the Port Orchard tornado of 2018 was the strongest tornado in the state of Washington since 1987. The speeds of the tornado were 120 to 130 miles per hour, and the tornado was on the ground causing destruction for about 1.4 miles and as long as five minutes. In that time, there are 450 structures, such as houses, that were damaged. And all these natural occurrences are affected by climate change and the impacts of environmental destruction. On September 20th, 2019, people in my county grew very angry about the climate change crisis. Kitsap County was a part of the youth-led global climate strike. According to Kitsap Sun, students from Kingston High School stood up and walked out of their classrooms to peacefully protest the climate crisis across the world. Then in Bremerton, a whole bunch of people of different ages came together by the Manette Bridge for a march hosted by 350 West Sound Climate Action. In conclusion, I see a lot of people, a lot of littering fine signs here in Washington, and I would like to change the fact that people still litter. It would be great to put Washington State in the top 10 states with the lowest pollution in the United States. To do this, I can specifically contribute by picking up trash while on a walk. Or when I see people about to throw trash on the ground, I could stop them. My goal may not be easy, but at least I want to live the rest of my life as healthy as I can while also restoring the planet. The end. Thank you, Alex. Great, great job. Again, giving us facts and from another location, in this case, case Washington State. Um, truly, the environmental problems are everywhere, aren't they, Alex? Uh, thank you so much. Natalia Brown is next. Natalia? Hello. Uh, my name is Natea. My piece is called Life Without Kasese. Um My Native American name given to me in the roundhouse is Kasese. In Pomo language from the Elam colony, Kasese means butterfly. In Native American culture, the butterfly is the messenger between the spirit world and the living world. It is sacred. I have always felt a deep connection between myself and the butterfly. I truly am grateful to have been lucky enough to get such a beautiful animal as my spirit animal. When my family or myself see a butterfly flying, we always wonder what it's doing. Is it delivering a message to someone? Is it trying to find a spirit? Or is it just soaring past me to make sure I'm okay? My grandpa Marvin Brown recently passed away and it has been one of the hardest things for me to overcome in my life. He was one of the last elders in our tribe and everyone looked up to him, his siblings, and his parents. He was a role model to everyone in our family. Growing up, he was always with my brother and I and supported us in every single thing we did. He never quit talking about us and spoiled us rotten. He loved shopping for clothes, but the only thing he loved more than that was shopping with his grandkids. If any of my cousins, aunties, or uncles needed any type of help, they would ask my grandpa. Whether it was financial help or just help changing a doorknob, my grandpa would do it. He knew everything. He knew how to write stories, he was great with numbers, he was a handyman, and just like the majority of the family, he was a superstar athlete. I have a lot of dreams about him while the rest of my family doesn't. They tell me they wish they did. I like to believe it's because of the name I was blessed with. It gives me the opportunity to see my grandpa again. 
I don't talk to him in my dreams. I just see him and I know that he's okay. When I see him in my dreams, I don't see him as what he looked like during his last couple years. I see him when he was still quite healthy, before he got really sick. When he was alive, everywhere we went, he would tell people what Kasese meant, even strangers, because it was so special to him. It was my grandfather, it was my grandfather's brother, as well as my own, who gave me my namesake. My culture is extremely important to me. My mom is white, but my dad is Hawaiian and Native American. My great grandparents were Maoli, which are Native Hawaiians. I try hard to keep in touch with my Native American and Hawaiian roots. I know a small amount of both languages and I dance as well. I started native dancing, which is called Eha, as soon as I could walk. I started hula around eight years old. Native Americans and Hawaiian have a strong connection to the animal kingdom and the spirit world. Almost everything in our culture is based around those. When we dance, both Hawaiian and native, we do so barefoot. This is because the land underneath us is sacred. This is my ancestors' land. This is my land. When my ancestors were taking care of our land, life was simple, no pollution. We cared for the animals as they cared for us. We took care of our home. When European settlers and the US government came, that is truly where our country changed. Fast forward to present day. Our own land isn't even considered ours, ours anymore, and the people who live on it don't care for it the way that they should. The air is polluted, climate change is affecting everything, especially the population of wildlife. As I said, natives have a spiritual connection to animals. With climate change and global warming, this is decreasing the population of sacred animals, such as buffalo, turtles, salmon, and most importantly to me, butterflies. The decrease of wild wildlife due to climate change is truly saddening. It is sad to even think that because of the people living here are treating our land so horrible that it is literally killing living species who were here before us. Personally, I love animals and thinking about the endangered or already extinct animals devastates me. But when the sacred animals are gone, I honestly feel that life is going to be much different for everyone, for anyone of native heritage. I couldn't imagine life without butterflies. Currently, monarch butterflies are in danger because of global warming. Once one species of butterfly starts to die off, so does the rest. My name and the meaning of it became a part of me. If butterflies were to go extinct, it is like a part of me is being taken, a part that I will no longer be able to physically see. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, I really enjoyed your piece. Uh, again, the naming of the butterflies. That's, you talked about an old tradition, where um, a long-standing tradition where we were named in the na a roundhouse. Uh, given a name, and that's a name that'll be with you forever. Yeah. So, and goes to as we believe it to the next world with you. <laughs> so, thank you, Nat Natalia. All right, uh, we have Tuli Striplin is next. Hi, I'm Tuli. Um, my what I wrote is named as one life together we make change, um, and it starts off like. The black raven soars through the hot wind watching over the land of the North America. Its next meal on its mind like any other animal. This omnivore can taste the nuts and yearns for it to be real. This omnivore can taste, oh, the sun beaming on the wings of this magnificently smart animal um, is very, it's a very adaptable creature. It rides alongside breezes so gracefully with intention and solidarity. As the point of its beak pierces the crisp air, the raven glides down to rest. The animal feels the peace as he sits quietly and observes. He also feels the despair of the citizens, almost chilling, but the temperature doesn't drop. It's quiet in the town, in the world. He almost feels hopeless, but he understands and accepts, then moves on, for he knows it's just another day, same as any other. People have always held ravens in high regard for their intelligence and knowledge. Almost every indigenous tribe in the world has stories about ravens, especially creation stories. Stories about birth and life. Since the beginning of time, they have been associated with healing, magic, and successful hunting. These shamantic birds are revered by most cultures. These ravens are also an indicator of environmental health. If the raven population decreases, then we know that something is wrong with the environment. So he takes off using all the muscles in his legs with phenomenal ease. Gliding again, watching. Continuing like this for a while, he goes a long way. While peacefully flying through the tasteless blue sky, he is now in South America, 
not as a raven, but instead as an Indian condor, another bird whose stories are shared within the people of the land. Oh, truly, okay. I'm so t listening to you read there. Um, do you, do you want to talk about, I mean, it was really interesting in your piece, and people will get to read all of it, about how you track the birds watching the raven and then the condor, which are coming back, by the way, um, uh, looking down on everything. Why did you, what attracted you to the raven? What made you pick the raven to start with, or these birds, these birds to, to start with? Um, I, I really connected with the raven and I feel like the birds really are able to see a lot more than people can because they have a totally different perspective on the world and they see everything and they feel everything. So I feel like I just went with that to hopefully have the perspective of the raven as like, um, it, I don't know how to explain it. It just, they see everything and hopefully they see all the changes that the environment has come to. And you know, Tuli, they're really smart. You can teach ravens, they've found up to 26 languages. Wow. And then people say, well, why don't they keep them like minor birds or carrots? Because they're so clever, they can't be trusted. They'll be real friendly and then they'll peck at you and get loose and okay. run. So very smart. <laughs> um, good choice, Tuli. Thank you so much. Great job. All right. Now to your sister, Eliana. Eliana. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so my piece is called Unity and Health. And I'm going to be reading the last two paragraphs of it. Um, it basically, the whole thing is kind of long, but it, it explains what happened, what is happening, and what is going to happen unless we have change. So here's the last two paragraphs. There are many drastic changes fueled by climate change that I fear will impact my indigenous community as well as many others. Sea level rising will cause more flooding in coastal areas, affecting communities and cultural resources. Along with sea level rising, severe storms will cause flooding, again affecting communities and cultural, cultural resources. Droughts will be longer, hotter, and more severe during these droughts. And during those droughts, fire will be more common and severe, which may be a big problem in California. Less snow will fall on mountains, which leads to less water in the summer, Plants and animal species may shift ranges, migrations, or disappear altogether from all these crises, and groundwater will be even harder to find and retrieve. Where indigenous communities live, such as on coasts, deserts, mountains, or on islands, may be forced to raise their entire communities or move to safer areas. All Pacific Islanders and indigenous peoples are vulnerable. I hope that people will start to realize that the future is so uncertain and anything can happen. We as a society need to face the facts and listen to our earth when it cries out for help. If we expect the worst case scenario and prepare for that, then we will be better off than doing nothing or taking half measures. We need to accept everyone for who they are and educate children about the hard truth because once we do, it may not be so hard for the indigenous people and communities to be heard at last. To step forward and grow together, instead of constantly being held back by the privileged and uneducated. To be successful is a team effort and we will only save our planet if people stick together to reach a goal. It should not be a race to be won by whoever got there first, but should be a gradual climb up a set of stairs. And at the top of that staircase is unity and health. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Eliana. Um, you mentioned too in, in your essay um, that, you know, they talk in school about a lot of things, but they don't, they leave out a lot. And you yeah. know what? You filled in a lot. Did you research? I, well, first of all, I just want to commend you and say to you, 
keep speaking. Keep speaking what the schools don't teach you. <laughs> speak for all of us and speak for your fellow students uh, and keep writing. Uh, did you, some of the stuff that you didn't get in school, did you research? How did you, how did you find that to back up your views, Elia? I, I did research a lot. It, it took me quite a long time because I didn't, I didn't know if any of the websites I, I um, went to were like biased or something. So I tried really my best to find accurate um, information. And um, yeah, I just did a lot of research. And once I did it, it really opened my eyes to like what our schools are missing out and why I just, so many questions rose in my head about why we're learning the things we're learning and why we haven't learned other things yet when they're like right there I, I can look it up i can just like type it down on my computer and it's right there so why can't it be in our schools you know um and and thank you you have a premier you can't see her but my friend jane is in the room a premier journalist and i think you know jane and she'll tell you that as a journalist, as a writer, one of the things you always have to do is sort out information. You just can't, a writer just can't take things that one per person might tell them, but you have to really weigh out the information, whether it's just the stuff you get in school. And I will say this in closing, Eliana, today more than ever with all the stuff you see online and stuff, you really have to sort out the truth. And I commend you for sorting out the truth. And I ask you to keep doing it. So good job. <laughs> um, on all of you, thank you so much. I want to remind everybody to please uh, turn off your cameras before uh, I do the closing note. So if you take a moment and turn off, uh, or, or excuse me, turn on your cameras. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't even read up here. Uh, and I was just putting out, please turn on your cameras, everybody, if you would. Uh, and I'll give the closing notes here. There's the two striplings, but I think there's others. <laughs> there you go. I see Malaya, Natalia, Alex, Alea. Everybody back on? Is everybody on? Can I get some way of knowing? I, I believe so. Okay. Um, so, again, I just want... Uh, to sum this up and say, not only did we see what a good job our students did here and our teachers in working with them, but how important this work is. And if I can take any, all of us who watch this now, have been watching this now or will watch this in the future, if we can take anything away from this, it is what these young native students are doing. And it can give all of us, native and non-native, hope. Because these young people are doing the work and are showing us they can do the work and they can communicate what needs to be communicated. And for all of you, you young people, you young writers, thank you. I started my life as a professor, was hoping to do the right thing. Um, and just seeing you and watching this, you've made my own work worthwhile. It will go on. Keep moving. Keep going on. Thank all of you so much. Mm -hmm.